Welcome everyone to this webinar about hosting large online co-creation workshops. My name is Lotta Strand. I'm co-founder at Svava. And um, in this webinar, we will uh, conduct an interview. We will uh, give you a short demo and we will talk a lot about how to succeed with those large online workshops that I know a lot of you are hosting, joining, or are going to host in the coming future. With me today, I have my, uh, my CEO, Elia Merling, uh, and um, I'll give the floor to you. Excellent. So, warm welcome, Peter Sandberg. We're, we're very happy to have you here today. Uh, we actually met uh, a few years ago when I was living in Stockholm. Um, and it's been great to reconnect because I had the opportunity to actually join in in one of these online co-creation workshops that you were hosting. So I've seen firsthand that you're very, very talented at doing these kind of things. And, and it's something that people are finding uh, very, very difficult to do. So just like to short off, start off and give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So just short, who is Peter Sandberg? Thank you, Laia. Hi, all. Um... I, um, I am uh, a, what's called an innovation strategist uh, at RISE, and RISE is uh, the Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, it's a, a government-owned uh, polytechnical uh, research institute, uh, where I have the great pleasure of working with innovation and innovation strategy. And a large part of that is to um, come up with good practices and tools and methods for working with uh, innovation uh, in, in uh, the large organizations mainly. And uh, a lot of that uh, is also um, working with and facilitating uh, workshops in, in different formats. And now, of course, during uh, the corona times, uh, we, have, um, uh, we, we, we have made the transition from, from doing uh, physical workshops um, into digital workshops. Excellent. It's going to be really exciting to learn about that. I, I also happen to know that you are the producer of a podcast called Spinnovation, which is Sweden's leading podcast in innovation. Could you share just a little bit about that? Uh, yes, uh, that's true. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm a huge podcast fan, uh, and, and I found, it, I mean, the world we live in today with, with all this free information um, is it, it's just extraordinary. And uh, podcasts uh, are, are a, a superb format for, um, uh, for having uh, in-deep discussions because you're not limited to only like a five-minute uh, broadcast time. You can go as deep as you want. Uh, usually my episodes uh, are one hour, um, uh, quite in-depth discussions with uh, my great guests that all are very generous in sharing their insights and experience from working with uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, it, it serves as, a, as an uh, inspiration, I think, for, for many people working within the innovation space. Great, and uh, I recommend everyone to check out that podcast. And before we dive in, because I want you to share a little bit about the process behind hosting a, a large online co-creation workshop, maybe we just set the, the ground floor. I mean, how, how do you define co-creation? What, what do you mean by, by co-creation? Um, co-creation is basically when you involve uh, people and stakeholders, uh, maybe from um, different organizations, uh, or different parts of organizations, and um, uh, you create, um, it could be the future, <laughs> together with them. Uh, and, and usually that's a, a large part um, of uh, working with a structured innovation process uh, at your company. Uh, you want to involve uh, as many people as possible, uh, and not only from your own organization, uh, it's super beneficial to also be able to involve it could be customers or, or suppliers uh, or other kinds of, of stakeholders that can be a, a huge contributing factor in your own innovation work. And, and uh, we, uh, we call these co-creation workshops um, because they are not just uh, based around uh, what is classically called brainstorming or ideation, but we also try to 
um, create artifacts um, and results from those workshops that uh, sort of like um, act as, as the bridge between just the uh, ideas uh, to actually uh, bridging over into a project phase to, to turn them into reality. Excellent. So I think you, a good place to start is really to let you zoom in a little bit on the process and you know share you know what the, what could this look like and how do you plan and prepare and and execute uh, an online yes. co-creation workshop and then after that we can zoom out again and look at the learnings and insights from that. Sure. This is what the typical co-creation digital workshop could, uh, can look like. Uh, when we do this in a, in a physical format. Uh, they can be, they can stretch out actually out into two days even, uh, depending on how many participants we have. Uh, the ones we've done digitally uh, are uh, one day workshops. And um, when you're holding a workshop, of course, the, the uh, scheduling is uh, super important. And uh, this is how, how we have choose to visualize uh, a, a typical daily schedule then. So we have a, a um, a uh, part that is before lunch and then uh, an hour lunch and then we continue uh, after lunch again. Um, the, one of the, my experiences from doing digital workshops is that the, the productivity and the output is uh, as good as any physical workshop. But um, for some reason, I mean, in a physical workshop, I'm sure you all know that, you know, people are shuffling out, you know, in, in breaks to fetch coffee and stuff like that. And there's always this hassle of having them to sit down again and, and start working uh, on, on the next um, uh, session. But um, uh, for some reason, the, the, the time seems to pass much faster <laughs> in, in a digital workshop. And even though the time allocation is uh, approximately the same as in physical workshops, it's, uh, it feels uh, as um, it's, um, every minute is, is utilized. So if you can have, um, if you have the time for actually stretching workshops a little bit more, and um, uh, not just like in this example, uh, that could be beneficial. But we, we also appreciate that, that um, um, you want to be um, sort of like careful with um, um, people's time and make the most of it. So that's why we have it in, in this slightly compressed format. And um, usually there, there are sort of like five basic steps uh, in our process. And you start with an introduction, of course, and then we often have what, what, what we call the sort of like a challenge brief. Basically, you set up sort of like the the, the task uh, for the day, sort of like a, what we are supposed to uh, be occupied with, what kind of um, problem or challenge that we're trying to, to solve. Um, and that can be pretty wide ranging. It could be anything from uh, developing a new innovation portfolio for an insurance company, or it could be how to, um, how you best can utilize um, the Internet of Things uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, usually, the more specific you are in your challenge, uh, the more you can expect to get out from a workshop. Uh, so it's, it's not too broad or too fuzzy, uh, but it's up to you. And um, then we have three basic sessions to develop. Um, our ideas and, and to tackle the challenges. And, and the very first one is the, um, uh, a tool that we have that's called the Challenge Archipelago, and, and I'll describe it shortly soon. Uh, that's basically a, an, an uh, insight tool uh, and a dialogue tool to, to get everyone on the same page, but also allow them to explore the problem area a little bit more in depth uh, before you jump over into the more sort of like um, creative ideation phase. But then we also have, um, as the last session, uh, we work with uh, um, something that we call the project canvas canvases, could also be idea canvases or innovation canvases. Basically, that's where you visualize and, and uh, concretize your uh, um, ideas. 
and make them more tangible and also uh, we can have them as a jumping off base to actually then communicate those ideas and and um, uh, get feedback on them and then um, create real projects from them. so re really reduce the, the time needed from going from an idea to an actual project uh, so those are, are the the main steps the, the challenge archipelago um, is um, we, we have this as a physical tool uh, so um, you divide the participants into groups and of course it, it, it's a super good advice here is is to already have pre-arranged groups and you write down the names uh, on the on the screen so that everyone knows what group they belong to and you can either give the groups a number or, or a color or whatever you want. Uh, in this particular exercise, we, we give them actually colors. So, so you see that little red uh, um, uh, piece there. Um, so that's for the red group. And, and uh, that little um, avatar there is, is on a boat and he's sort of like traveling through an archipelago and you have to stay at, at, at the islands and explore them. And what you want to do with them is sort of like you want to, for each, island and, and the island represents a, an area that is related to the challenge and uh, you give that uh, area or, or, or challenge theme uh, a name and uh, in the physical tool we use um, flags for that so you have yellow flags for, for the themes then you have red flags for the challenges within that sub theme and green flags for uh, opportunities and basically this is what it looks like uh, and, and this is fantastic tool for people that I've never met before and they come from different uh, backgrounds and, and with different experiences and knowledge. They can all contribute to this and, and give a, a very good comprehensive view on the, the challenge area that you're going to work with. Uh, when we do this digitally, uh, we are uh, in, the, in the process of developing actually a fully fledged digital tool for this that will actually be a virtual tool made in, in Unity 3D, which is a game engine actually, but uh, we're developing it so, so that people online can collaborate and create those islands. Um, when we do this now in, in, in a sort of like a transition phase here, we do it like in, in a very, very bare bones way. So um, uh, we just do it in PowerPoint actually. Uh, and um, you could also do it in other tools, and, and I guess we touch uh, on them later on, like uh, Mural or, or Miro, which are sort of like whiteboard applications. Um, and basically what the, the groups get are um, um, these um, templates in, in PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, just as an example of what it can look like, the island name is in this case is Integrity and um, uh, the challenges uh, then are in red and, and in green. And uh, usually the groups during one hour, they are able to create sort of like four to eight of those um, islands. And uh, then we present it uh, for, for all the other groups as well. And when you work in groups, uh, I guess many of you, if you used Zoom before, um, uh, it has this great uh, functionality of creating breakout sessions. Um, that um, uh, so you basically create rooms and then you assign the participants into those rooms and then you as a facilitator you can step into any of those rooms and I, I really recommend you if, if you are the sole uh, facilitator to to make sure that you actually visit each and every room and, and just ask them quickly if they need help or input or anything uh, and just uh, keep your, your finger on the pulse so to speak um, and um, yeah. and then of course you, you can break those sessions whenever you want or you have a, a, a predetermined limit on, on how much um, or how, how long uh, a breakout session should stretch. Then everyone gets sort of like uh, uh, collected back in, into the main uh, meeting area. Uh, and it's super important that they actually present the findings um, to everyone else because you, you want uh, all that knowledge to sort of like um, uh, spread out into the room and into the minds of every participant so that everyone has uh, uh, the same kind of uh, knowledge and, and insight. Um, from there on, when you have these uh, challenge islands uh, and, and we have listed a lot of both challenges and opportunities, now you have sort of like a very comprehensive view uh, of, of um, uh, the, the challenge you want to tackle. 
and then you can start with the ideation. And ideation, of course, is, is sort of like, uh, the, we many times call it brainstorming as well. Um, and there are many, many ways to do brainstorming and, and there are many, many tools for it. But um, uh, we have successfully used your tool, uh, so the, the Swava tool. And uh, if you want to, Elia, you, you can show people what it looks like. So I'm just going to show you a little bit what it looks like if you want to use our tool for ideation, which you're more than welcome to do. Um, the way that it works is basically that you go to our website and there you set up a meeting beforehand and when people show up at the meeting you invite them to join uh, by pointing the browser to a specific address with the Svava app and then using a meeting code to join in. So this is just a demo uh, meeting that I set up that has some data in it to give you some ideas and basically uh, the way that Svava works is that when you set up uh, a workshop or meeting in small but you get a pack of slides so there is like a process with a set of slides already created for you um, this is the first step where people join in and the facilitator controls uh, the steps in the slides so when I as a meeting need to go to the next step everyone's uh, screens are updated and the, there is also then a process here built in uh, for this ideation session where we're first coming up with you know what are the areas or um, what are the different islands based, for example, from the Challenge Archipelago that Peter just shared that we want to use as a springboard for our ideation. Um, so once we have come up with these, um, then we then go on to the next step, which is the idea contribution phase. And this is actually uh, the closest resemblance of uh, the post-its notes because the participants here uh, select the relevant uh, question that they want to add their ideas to. Um, and then they type in their ideas. So, for example, I may have an idea that we should use AR, a augmented reality, for example, to nudge people to change behaviors. Um, and then I enter the, my ideas in here as a participant. And you can do this as individuals or also as groups. And in the next step, uh, we're actually at looking together at the different ideas that we have collected and clustering them together. Um, so. Um, for example, here um, we have two ideas for augmented reality, then we would actually join these two uh, together and uh, create a new card. So this is really how this uh, tool was being used um, in one of the sessions that I had the opportunity of joining Peter Sandberg in. Um, and uh, there's also an additional step where you can have the participants do a, a simple dot voting and, and vote for the ideas that they feel uh, are the most compelling. Great. Uh, Peter, did you have anything else that you wanted to share? Yes. Uh, it's very important to focus not on quality of the ideas, not at this stage. Uh, that will be done in the next stage. Uh, so you want to focus on volume. And the, the, the reason for that is basically you want to create this kind of um, movement between brilliant ideas and absurd ideas. And the reason for that is, is that generally when you start generating ideas, you, 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 you take the ideas that are closest to your mind. Uh, and, um, uh, and once you sort of like written down all those, you sort of like cleared your mind of, of all those ideas, then it becomes a little bit empty. Uh, and it feels like you have sort of like exhausted uh, your, your search. You're done now with the idea search. Uh, and and it's very easy also to have this little uh, sensor cap on you sort of like yeah well I don't want to say this silly idea or anything but actually it's very very beneficial to also come up with um, uh, silly ideas or, or absurd ideas and we uh, many times actually we can even start a brainstorming session with uh, uh, just saying that now you have to um, generate uh, only absurd ideas and the most absurd idea will actually win a prize or something like that uh, that's a good way also to sort of like break the ice and, and uh, getting people um, to dare to sort of like uh, stretch themselves. And the reason also here is sort of like you can see th this is actually from a real study uh, where the participants generated uh, ideas um, in, in the classical way. Uh, and for the first 60 ideas, they came up with five really brilliant ideas. Uh, but then it sort of like was, you know, they felt that they had no, nothing more to give. 
And then they were instructed to only generate absurd ideas for a while. And those absurd ideas then led to new ideas and new insights. Uh, and as you can see in the last phase of the ideation session, they generated more brilliant ideas in, in, those, in those last 20 idea, uh, ideas than they did in the first 60 ideas even. So um, I, I want you to take that with you when you're, when you're setting up um, ideation sessions like that. And of course, we want to go for volume uh, just to, to really uh, explore the, the idea space. Um, then, um, I like to say, and I, I, I have stolen this uh, from someone, I don't remember whom, unfortunately, and that is sort of like, when an idea is put on a post-it, uh, that's where it has its first near-death experience. Uh, you need to identify and salvage those little fragile uh, ideas and, and nurse them uh, into health uh, and, and become a little bit more stronger. And the tool we use for that is uh, what we call a, a concept canvas or project canvas. Basically, it's just uh, in our physical workshops, it's a, a sheet of paper, uh, usually like, like a, a three size. Uh, could be larger as well, uh, where you describe your idea much more in depth than uh, would be possible on a post-it post note. Uh, you give it a name, uh, you give it a description, uh, you uh, visualize it, you have quite a large area there for visualization as such, with a, and, and everyone can visualize. It's just about making boxes or arrows or, or um, uh, bubbles. Um, and, and little uh, stickmen, uh, and then you kind of have, you, these can be tailored for each session and each uh, specific challenge that you're working on, uh, but usually what you want to have is, is sort of like a description, uh, also usually you want to sort of like, a, you want that idea to meet or, or describe what kind of um, need it meets, uh, and then you would uh, like to maybe describe uh, the possible impact of that idea, and, and uh, what the stakeholders involved are, and also maybe identify potential um, partners uh, in, in a future project, or and what the next steps are in order to make this turn this into a real project. And um, uh, this is a close up on, on what it might look like uh, in the physical workshop. So digitally, uh, we create these in in um, PowerPoints, uh, and again, you can use uh, Mural or Mirror as well to do this. And um, uh, each group, you, you do breakout sessions again, and each group now gets to select uh, from their huge pile of ideas. They select the ones that they believe in, or maybe they have clusters of ideas that uh, contribute to, to a, a bigger, better idea. And then they uh, concretize them um, and uh, conceptualize them in, in a canvas like this. And then also you have in, in, the, in the bottom corner there, we usually insert some kind of um, uh, help for them uh, uh, prioritizing or, or ranking and stacking the ideas. So you can sort of like estimate the feasibility uh, uh, and the impact and, and move that cross around and, and um, uh, then use that uh, as a selection criteria for, for going onwards. And usually the, the groups, um, are able to create somewhere between three to four, sometimes even up to five of these canvases. And then we reconvene again uh, and um, uh, present all those ideas again, like very, very short uh, pitches, like uh, maybe one to two minutes maximum per, per concept canvas. And uh, that's basically it. So the, the, these concept canvases with the visualized and described ideas, those are the, the uh, very, very tangible output from such a co-creation workshop. And they have been used um, to, to create um, idea portfolios or, or even fully fledged um, innovation project portfolios as such. Excellent. So it's really helpful, I think, to see, you know, how you have transitioned the way that you do, you know, analog face-to-face -face workshops um, to using digital tools. And is it correct to, to summarize it is that the process actually looks quite similar 
to how you run it, uh, have, have run it uh, offline, uh, but you have really tweaked the tools and digitized the way that you do the inputs and things like that. But otherwise, the process is very similar. Yes, uh, it, it's actually exactly the same process. It's uh, also uh, exactly as productive, um, and the output is uh, comparable to the physical workshops. Of course, there are sort of like drawbacks uh, for each. Um, you you tend not to get the same sort of like personal human. Uh, subliminal interaction between participants, but they can still produce stuff and work together quite well in a digital environment. Um, and al also, of course, when you, if you have the possibility when you split up uh, uh, the participants into groups, if you have like a group leader that is also sort of like acquainted with this process, it gets even more efficient. But mm -hmm. the, even self-taught groups or, or people that never met before, never used these tools, uh, it, it's pretty self-instructive. Um, one of the unexpected but quite obvious benefits from working digitally is that all of a sudden, all the post-its are readable or all these concept canvases are readable because usually people just scribble you know, with, uh, with their hands and uh, it's not always easy to see what they have written. But uh, now, uh, all of a sudden, uh, it all looks... Um, uh, very good. Yeah, I recognize uh, having to take care of post-it notes. Sometimes you don't see the scribbles and sometimes they have fallen off. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you this one. One. I'll put it here. <laughs> yeah, so nothing gets lost in this process. Yeah, so coming, doing this transition to, to doing more workshops online, what, what, what has been the most surprising? Yeah, well, I, the most surprising thing has, has been, uh, I'd say, how uh, comparably easy it has been to make that transition. It, it's not as hard as you might think. Uh, and um, even the, just the first time when we did it, it, it actually went uh, very well. And, mm -hmm. and um, it's, um, uh, I, I, I can really encourage uh, anyone that sort of like is interested in this but haven't tried yet, you know, just start trying. It, it's, uh, it's really not uh, that hard. And, and as long as you have like a very, very clear schedule and, and, and the exercises that you put into your workshop is sort of like well described, then uh, you shouldn't have a problem really. What do you think about the size? Because in the title we put large co-creation workshops. Like, what, what do you think is a good size for doing an online co-creation workshop? I, I, uh, the, the largest we have done physically is uh, with 50 to 60 participants. And I'd say it's hard to make a productive workshop, at least a one-day workshop, uh, with more participants than that. Uh, yeah. And ideal group sizes uh, are maybe more around maybe 30 or 40. Uh, but it depends. If you have like co-facilitators that can help out, then, then uh, maybe you can go larger, definitely. And so let's say we are 30, we have 30 participants. Um, how would you break that down in terms of uh, the number of groups and, and facilitators if you were to recommend some general mm -hmm. recommendations? Um, you don't want to groups that are too large uh, because you want everyone to feel engaged. Uh, and it, it's, it's the same if it's physical or digital. Uh, and my recommendation is usually that a group should uh, ideally, I think, have uh, five participants, four to five participants, uh, no more. Uh, and, uh, but the, just three participants, it, it, you don't get the same dynamics uh, either. So, so I, I think, maybe, well, maybe four to six participants maximum uh, yeah. in a group. Yeah. You said something interesting about the time, that it's almost like time becomes more compressed in these online workshops. Have you reflected anything upon why? Why Is that just a feeling or is it that there is more density in the, inter, in the activity? I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe in, in a live discussion when we sit around the table, there's a lot of simultaneous conversations going on and, and it may be sort of like we, we just utilize the, the, the bandwidth and, and multi-channel communications that we as people tend to have. Uh, in a digital workshop, it becomes a little bit more linear maybe in, in, in the discussion. Um, I don't know if, if that's uh, the reason or not really. I haven't really managed to really put my finger on it. It's just a general experience. 
Yeah. And uh, so if you were to look into the, the crystal ball, like we look into the future, now people are starting you know, to host more and more meetings online. Uh, there's some discussions. I hear some people are thinking of going back to their offices soon or after the summer. I mean, what are these behaviors uh, and these new skills and tool sets that we have built up now during the crisis do you think will remain uh, sustainably in the future? I think that... Uh... A lot of people has, of course, already tried maybe digital tools and, and digital ways of working, but not the majority. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the majority has sort of like been forced into using all these fantastic tools that are available. And that has sort of like uh, paved the path for a, a great acceptance uh, of uh, working from home, for instance, having more video meetings than physical meetings. And I think that it also sort of like, um, uh, extends into also having workshops because having a physical workshop especially if you're having many participants and, and also coming from outside the company it's a lot of time and travel and, and planning for that yeah with the uh, digital workshops it's much much more easier to to uh, assemble people and and uh, also from all parts of the world actually if, if you want to go the, uh, that far uh, so I, I think there is, once people have tried it and also see that, yeah, you, you get a good result from it, then uh, some of the traditional workshops will be replaced with this. But also I think you will have more workshops maybe just because now they are easier to, to facilitate and, and, um, and do. Sure. Okay. And two final questions before we open up. Um, uh, what is your advice to someone that is really in this transition now? You know, they're thinking about hosting more online workshops, uh, but they really like, you know, physical post-its and the whiteboards and stuff like that. What is your advice? Like, where should they start and, and how would you help them to get started? Well, it, it's just uh, to, to uh, dip your feet in the water or, or get your hands dirty. Just try out different tools. Um, I think that we can expect to see a lot of new tools uh, coming uh, quite soon, probably. But there are also a lot of existing tools that are really, really good. It, as I showed you here, I mean, just working with Zoom and, and with PowerPoint, you can, you can get pretty far. Uh, your tool for ideation in a very, very structured way, uh, in, in terms of like you have a ready set up a process and you even have different processes uh, depending on different needs. That's a great tool, um, but also, uh, which we didn't delve into this time, are sort of like whiteboard tools like uh, Miro or, or Mural. Uh, they are great collaborative um, uh, experiences uh, and, and tools. Uh, and uh, if you never worked with them before, it can be a bit uh, bewildering maybe on how you can utilize them, but try them out. They are also great tools for this. And, and uh, they create a, a great sense of um, participation, I think, and, and presence that I like. Excellent. And, and my last question is like, okay, now you're at the frontier leading this, Peter, and you're already, you're doing a lot of, of big online workshops and things like what, for yourself as, as an expert, like what is the next challenge that you want to take on? Like, is there something like, I want to do this or reach this level? Is there something you're dreaming of in the landscape of? online co-creation workshops? Um, I, uh, I played a couple of years ago, I, I got totally bogged down uh, in, in uh, the game, online game World of Warcraft, where people from all over the world meet uh, that I never met before. They enter into like a super complex environment to solve a super complex problem. In this case, you want to slay a dragon or something like that, right? And uh, they do that in real time. Uh, and uh, sometimes the process can take several hours uh, and you have maybe to repeat it in order to actually solve that uh, challenge. And it's a very, like, it's, it's, um, it's a problem that has no bearing on the real life, but it's a super complex problem. Uh, and uh, still people manage to solve it. I would like to see um, such a uh, digital environment that we can create uh, online where we actually are able to solve super complex problems in real time with the cutting edge tools like mm -hmm. multiplayer games or something like that. Cool, and we saw that in the virtual uh, archipelago that you were planning there uh, from RISE. 
there were some game elements to that. Yeah, uh, three yeah, three yeah. Three yeah. Games. Oh, yeah great. great. Thanks. All right, perfect. Thank you both of you. And we will now move on and answer some of the great questions that have come in. The first one that we received, Peter, is about uh, keeping the attention of your participants. The, the layout you presented was almost five hours and how do you save your participants from tiredness of staring at the screen and sitting still? Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a very good question um, uh, that we didn't address. But the, the, the way to do that is uh, basically to, to have very clear um, uh, times and keep to the times so that people know when they have breaks. Um, you should also allow, you can do different, very, very easy um, exercises also just before um, um, uh, an actual session, like uh, for instance, uh, stretching and stuff like that. And it's very easy to facilitate that as well. You know, on my latest workshop, I actually had a, a colleague that was also sort of like, she's an online um, uh, instructor <laughs> so she she uh, gave us some really nice um, uh, warm-up exercises stuff like that so so there are lots of ways to to keep people uh, keep people's attention and stuff like that but it's also very important to schedule the breaks so that people can actually stand up and go fetch something to eat or maybe if they're working from home then maybe maybe they need to uh, help up with the kids or whatever you know uh, people have some different uh, environments that they're working in yeah all right perfect and, and how, how, how do you expect your participants to prepare and, uh, and how do you make sure that they, they do prepare for your, your uh, workshops? It's, uh, it depends. Um, usually the, the, the participants uh, are not uh, that prepared and they don't have to necessarily, not for the workshops that, that uh, the way I do them. But of course, if you want them to come prepared, maybe they, you know, you want each and every participant to have a presentation about their organization or what they can contribute with or stuff like that, or just present a general brief. You need to coordinate with them uh, um, before and have a, like a very, even give them templates for what their presentation should look like and how many slides and so forth. Uh, and also if there is any required reading material that they need to do on, on beforehand. But uh, ideally, you should also structure your workshop so you don't have, the participants don't have to do that because uh, the standard use case is that some will have done it and some will not have. So you will still have to sort of like um, do that phase anyway. Okay. And, then, and when we look at your process, where would you recommend uh, starting to cluster the ideas and the input? Uh, do you do this? while people are ideating or is it more of a common activity after yeah. the ideation you do it after the ideation and and as elia showed you here very quickly you have a, a clustering uh, um, uh, opportunity and, and, and a step for that in, in in your particular tool when we do it physically or or um, uh, with other tools uh, you do it after all the ideas are generated and even presented uh, because uh, and you can do the clustering actually as ideas are presented um, you you can actually um, move uh, the the digital posters or real posters um, and, and the clusters will emerge uh, from that all right and and uh, what about prototyping uh, a lot of workshops are done you know you sit with lego and clay mm. and uh, mm. can you do this can you ask participants to prepare this material and have it with them or how would you uh, do this uh, I, I never try that uh, in a digital setting so uh, I don't have a good answer for it um, what I would say though is that this canvas uh, that we use um, it's uh, it's not a real prototype but it is um, uh, almost um, uh, moving in that direction because you have to visualize it uh, and you have to think uh, around sort of like what, what this idea consists of and also you, you start also planning ahead sort of like what do we need to do in order to make this happen so so the for me visualization is like super important and, and um, um, 
it takes it quite far. Uh, and and they, in these digital workshops, people just Google up images or, or they use a, a, a simple drawing program or anything. And, and they make fantastic visualizations from this. And, and so it, it's um, a prototype of a prototype, you could say. I've seen this uh, used in, in, um, in teaching environments. And that is you could go into Minecraft, for instance, and you can create prototypes in there. Oh, yeah. And, and, and what about the invitations and how do you create diversity within, within the group? It's, uh, th that's also a, a super important issue, actually. Um, it's, um, uh, you should uh, always uh, have a clear um, thought about uh, who the particip participants are. Uh, and divide the groups accordingly. And you want, uh, as you pointed out, you want as much diversity into each and every group. Uh, but of course, you can only play with what you have, for instance. And, and uh, sometimes it's just, you know, representatives from your company, and it's the same old people that you usually meet, and then, then you have to do with that, of course. Uh, but if you invite new people, maybe you get a, a broader mix that you can play with. Uh, but it's it's um, it's very very important uh, to consider that sort of like of course mixing genders but also ages and and maybe also ethnic backgrounds and and all that stuff. Um, uh, the more diverse the, the the better ideas you actually get from from uh, especially from ideation. Mm. All right. So thank you so much to all of our participants, everyone who asked questions. And special thank you to Peter for, for joining us and sharing uh, your thoughts and your input. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.